The date is March 17th, 2016. The time is 6.36 p.m. Rich Red. Present. Rob Collins. Here. Gary Ciccaroni. Jim Freeman. Ed Camone. Here. David Champy II. Present. Rich Zacker. Diane Smith. Here. Mr. Diane. Chairman, we have enough for a quorum. Thank you. Diane, will you sit for one of the absentees? That'd be a choice. Yep. Public comments. This. They consider this the first meeting of the year, after the town meeting? That I don't know, sir. Okay, well, we have to nominate and elect the planning board chairman and vice chairman. Any nominations for a chairman? Mr. Chairman, I nominate Rich Rett for chairman. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Accept the nomination. Is that how it goes? Uh, sure. I mean, right. I, I don't know. I mean, you might want to ask if there are other nominations. I, or maybe you did. Did he? I no. didn't. So I think normally you give everyone, a, everyone that wants to throw their hat in the ring or anyone who wants, who gets their somebody who wants to throw somebody else's hat in the ring, get everyone okay. together. So and then, then we would have a vote. So nomination for Rick Surrett is accepted. Are there any other nominations for chairman? Okay, hearing none. Uh, I don't know, I guess we can, uh, since we're making a decision motion, probably a few more. I move. Oh. Well, yeah, I uh, move to accept. I, I, I move that we elect Rick Charette as chairman. Second. Discussion. Discussion. Yes. Um, should we or can we wait for the rest of the board to be here in full in order to make the decision, or does it have to be done now? We have a quorum. Uh, Rob? I believe that we are obligated to elect officers at our first meeting. We could. We could cancel them, or we could either cancel the meeting or continue it at a later date. But I think that our rules of procedure are pretty clear, and I think probably the RSA say the same thing. That we're, this is one of the things we're supposed to do, um, because the chairman from last time he's supposed to only start the meeting, get the you know fill fill alternates, you know fill seats, and then then we do that election, and then whoever wins that would then take over the meeting and run, run it, you know, till, till the rest of the, till the next year. Diane? Um, I neglected to ask the question when the motion was to nominate you, and that should have been, will you serve if you're nominated and chosen? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So motion on the floor. Yes, and we have a second. We were in discussion. So the motion on the floor is uh, Rob Collins um, moved that the planning board elect uh, Rick Charette as chairman of the planning board. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Chairman, I nominate uh, David Champy for vice chairman. Second. Discussion? Uh, call for any other nominations. Oh, are they, don't you know one at a time? Uh, well, I th anyone can get nominated, right? Nomination is not a decision that we have to make. I mean, the person could could not accept it, but... Right. Are there any other nominations for vice chair? Discussion? All in fit. Yes. A little quicker this time. <laughs> um, I 
I would ask if the nominee would accept if he is chosen. Yes. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I make a motion that we elect David Chappie as Vice Chair of the Planning Board. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for serving. Okay, we're gonna build a wall. <laughs> <laughs> and the selectmen are paying for it. <laughs> Announcements, correspondence, and mail. An easy one for us. Town and country is here. Town and city. If anybody is interested in checking out this magazine, it will be in the room with the church. Evan Source Energy sent us a letter to inform us that they plan to trim and remove trees and brush adjacent to and beneath some of its power lines within the town. The works necessary to ensure the safe distribution of power and improve the reliable, reliability of electrical service to the customers. According to the records, Moose Mountain Road, Tumbledown Dick Road, and Lightford Road have been designated as scenic roads by the town. Please consider this letter a request from Eversource for a public hearing for the trimming and removal of the trees and brush along these roads within the proposed area pursuant to RSA 231-158. Please inform this office of the time and place of said meeting so we may have a representative present. A map highlighting the area to be trimmed is enclosed. And then there's another note in here that tells that all works performed in accordance with accepted Arbicultural standards, Lewis Tree Service. And there's a uh, schedule, identification of the trees, and the areas marked out on maps. Do we need to schedule a public hearing for this? Yes. Because it's utilities? Because it's the scenic, scenic roads. I think we're required. Before any trimming is done, we're required to do a public hearing, whether it's the road agent or somebody like that. I believe. They referenced the RSA. I guess we can pull that up. 231 colon 158. Ed, what's the date on that? January 20th. Yeah, 231 158 is effective designation as C. Mail branch 7th. I think it has some exceptions. They have highlighted here Tumble Down Dick Road, Moose Mountain Road. Another page for life. Next page. So this is related to work on scenic roads. Um, I'm reading from 231 colon 158 Roman numeral 2. Uh, any action taken to any by any utility or other person acting to erect, install, or maintain poles, conduits, cables, wires, pipes, or other structures pursuant to RSA 231 colon 159 through 189 shall not involve the cutting, damage, or removal of trees or the tearing down or destruction of stone walls or portions thereof, except with the prior written consent of the planning board or any other official municipal body designated by the meeting to implement the provisions of the subdivision. After a public hearing duly advertised as to time, date, place, and purpose, two times in a newspaper of general circulation in the area, the last publication to occur at least seven days prior to such hearing, provided, however, that a road agent or his designee may, without such hearing, but only with the written permission of the selectmen, remove trees or portion of trees 
which have been declared a public nuisance pursuant to RSA 231-145 and 231-146. When such trees or portions of such trees, such trees pose an imminent threat, blah, 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 blah. So this has, not only do we have to do a public hearing, we have to give them, after which we give them written consent. Right. It looks like there are sort of unusual requirements for the public hearing. Uh, normally, I think, George, correct me if I'm wrong, we normally would uh, publish a public hearing once. Yes. So this, this says that we have to do it twice. Mm -hmm. Is there any spacing in between the two publications? Uh, it just, after a public hearing duly advertised as to time, date, place, and purpose, two times in a newspaper of general circulation in the area. Um, the last publication to occur at least seven days prior to such hearing. Okay, so we need to set up a public hearing for the Eversource trimming. And George, that will need to be two notifications, two separate times. Correct me if I'm wrong, Rob, we have to put the same notice in the paper on two different days. That sounds like what we got to do. So they could be in a row, right? Yeah, if we want to, I mean... Or space them a, a day apart. Yeah, I mean, I don't know where George finds it easiest to, to do notice, but, I mean, if it was Grand State News, it's published once a week, so you'd do it two weeks in a row. If it were... Right. Fosters. Fosters, I don't know how often they publish, but... The Daily. The Daily, so you could do it two days in a row, I guess, and meet the requirements. That's normally where you put it, correct, George? I'm sorry? That's normally where you put it, is in uh, Foster's? Uh, yeah, I actually go back and forth depending on what your schedule is. Um, they, they do have a, um, a, a particular schedule, well, at least we have it in the rules procedure as far as um, what their times are, and they're, and they're different for both, both of those newspapers. Now, with putting the, putting the notice in two separate Newspapers satisfy that? It's not clear to me. It says it, it says two times in a newspaper. So I'm not sure. I don't know how the lawyers would interpret that. Diane, if, if I can just ask a question before you continue on that line, um, did I hear you say that they have a schedule? In that correspondence? Uh, it might not be a date. I don't think it was a schedule. Double check. David, you might want to take a look at that. I think it might be just a description of location of the trees. Oh. It might be a schedule. I just, I call it that because it looked like that. Okay. Right. Is that the matrix you're looking at, David? Yeah, there's there's no date on it. One of those supposed to be accomplished. But they've identified tree, particular trees? They yeah. have. Well, they said in the letter that what you read, I, what I heard you read, I thought, was that they, they don't seem to care when the hearing is going to be. It's your choice, and they'll, you're just going to tell them, and they'll show up. Right. So I, I think that it's entirely up to the planning board as to when to have a hearing. Sure. Now, the question was, is putting the notice in two separate newspapers, does that satisfy having it in a newspaper twice. It's not clear to me from reading the RSA that that would. But I'd be more concerned with how do we make the best use of George's time, right? That costs us money. I know. Right. Is it, I, mean, I guess the question would be, is it easier for George to like call the Grand State News and put the, and just in one call, put it in for both weeks or two days in a row for Foster's versus Doing, doing, making two calls and putting in two places. Right. You know. Um, so it'd be more cost, time-wise, cost-effective to make one call. Uh, maybe. I mean, assuming that he can, assuming that he can. Well, it would. You know, schedule something further in the head. You know, as long as they, the, you know, it's not like oh, you, you know, you can't, you can't call us to, you know, to, and, and schedule it so one for this time and one for next time. Assuming that they, you know, allow that then should, I would think it would be more cost-effective than to do it. You're right. I agree. 
Diane? There's one other cost factor, and that is the cost of actually placing the ad. George, which one usually has better rates? Um, it, the um, information that we, um, if, if I can. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, the information that we have in the rules of procedure, and it, and it is outdated, but it, it does have information there. It, um, for a two by two article, for uh, Foster's, it's sixty four dollars and forty cents. For um, for Granite State News, it's listed as sixty dollars and eighty cents. Again, I cannot verify that these are accurate to this day because there have been some changes that are going on in newspapers. So I think they're close enough. Yeah. Is one of them easier to deal with than the other? I, I n notice no difference. The only, the only thing is, is they are on different schedules. Um, for instance, at the bottom of Appendix J and Appendix K uh, for Fosters, it says, uh, for Friday edition, email by 4 p.m. on Wednesday. And for Appendix K for uh, Granite State, it says, for Thursday edition, email um, by noon on Monday. So I, I really, I really you know, have no, no problem with dealing with them. I, I, what I do is I, I email them the information exactly as it's supposed to be. Then I, what I do is I call to verify that they've received that and uh, look for some kind of uh, guarantee that it will be in a, on a specific date that will meet our requirements. Now, that, that schedule doesn't mean that they publish only on Friday, correct? That's correct. It could go on on different days. Yeah, I, I believe that, that both of them um, are twice a week that I can, I'm able to, to get a hold of them for that for publication. I would um, suggest putting two notifications in one week in Foster's. We can get that in for ne next week two times, according to that schedule. Correct, Judge? I think we can do that. And then have the public hearing when? At our next meeting, just at our next normal meeting? Sure. So we've got roughly four weeks until then. Right. So that should give George plenty of time to, because we have to get, have it one week, seven days ahead of the meeting, yep. right? So it gives us three weeks to, for it to be published twice. That seems like a no-brainer. All right, George, then would you please get the notice into Foster's two times? Yes. And schedule the public hearing at our next scheduled meeting. For Eversource. And George, um, the has to include time, date, place, and purpose. According to 231 colon 158. Roman numeral two. Did you want this? Yeah, no. Page 172. Okay, I just want to make sure I'm understanding of that. As far as the date, are, are they talking about the date of the public hearing or the date when the trees are supposed to be trimmed? Because we really don't. Uh, date of the public, you're noticing the public hearing. Okay. All right. So I think you would, in terms of, so be, you know, whatever the date is at 6.30, he, you know, this address. Yes. Um, and the purpose, I think you'd want to mention the, the, the three roads, that they're scenic roads, and that the ever, whoever it is ever, or, Eversource wants to trim some trees. Some of them are really asking for um, power lines to be taken down. They're hanging over them. Life's mm -hmm. road. Mm -hmm. One of government's road. Pretty bad. And they're, Diane, they're detailed enough in this that they actually list the species of tree and exactly why they're taking it down to. I, was so gonna, I wasn't going to ask that, but I, I was wondering about that. I think I beat you to the punch. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So is, is George also going to notify Eversource of the date and of the hearing? Uh, yeah. Did they ask to be notified? I think they did. I think that's what you said. I understood it too, Mr. Chairman. Yes. To be okay to notify them when the hearing will be judged. Okay. Are you okay with that? Yes, sir. Any more discussion on Eversource? Let's review our minutes from February 18th. I'm sorry, was that the end of the correspondence? 
Yes. Chairman, I move that we accept the meeting minutes of February 18th, 2016, as written. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Minutes accepted. Business. I'm going to move D up to A while, while we're hot on this tree removal thing. The road agent brought to our attention that there are five trees on Scenic Road, Life and Road, that are interfering with, with plowing. They're marked and they're down by the site, the opposite side of the street, um, east of the cemetery location. Five trees. Do they happen to be the same ones that ever source? They're not. Okay. So I tend I tend to go along with the road agent when he needs trees removed for plowing. And I did look at the five and they are right on the road. So I could see how they would be problematic. Maybe not this year, but not with snow years. 
So when you read um, the RSA earlier for Eversource, yeah. I sort of glossed over the rotation. 231, 158. I believe it said something about if a tree was a public safety issue or interference issue like that, that the road agent could get a letter from the selectman to remove the trees. Written permission of the selectman, remove trees or portions of trees that have been declared a public nuisance pursuant to RSA 231, 145, and 146. When such trees or portions of such trees pose an imminent threat to safety or property, and provided further that the public utility, that a public utility uh, is an emergency. Uh, so, I if, if they're a plowing problem, and I don't know that we're, he's going to be doing a whole lot more plowing this year. I'm not sure it would qualify as an imminent threat, but I think that would be up to the selectmen to decide. If the selectmen think that it is an imminent threat, they can give him written permission. Um, otherwise, I would suggest that we deal with it in the public, just do it. I mean, and let, and if the selectmen don't decide it's imminent threat, let's just piggyback that on the public here we're already going to have. And, you know, okay. and maybe instead of saying Eversource, say Eversource and the road agent or something, as far as why, and deal with all, you know, deal with all those trees. It's the same roads that we're already talking about, I think. Right. So if, um, If we put that in for the public hearing and the selectmen do agree that they're a threat. Not, and we don't have to talk about it. Okay. Right, if they give written permission prior to that, we don't have to deal with it. If they don't, then we do. And it costs us no more. That makes sense. Any discussion on this? George, will you add the road agent to that yes. public hearing? Yes. Could you let him know that we're, he should attend? Yes. Thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll notify Eddie that he's on for the public hearing. And if it's safety, he gets a letter from the selectman, which is fine. Um, you, you might, if I you think I recall, we handled it the last time this happened on a scenic road, which again was life and road. We uh, we made a decision here. Was it a year ago, two years ago? Does anyone remember? I don't know if it was to take the trees down, but it was trimming stuff. No, it was it was take them down. I don't recall that whether it was that case or not. We have since I've been involved in the planning work, we have had this public hearing for some reason or another before. Okay. It was a non-issue. Nobody showed up because. You know, nobody was in love with any particular one of those trees, I guess. But, you know, I mean, it's possible somebody's going to come in because their grandpa planted that tree and <coughs> they're going to make the case for keeping it or something. Yeah. Or, but it's possible. Okay, we'll, we'll leave it at that. We'll piggyback it onto the um, public care of the source. If, I mean, it's not inexpensive. I mean, it's not a huge expense, but it's not inexpensive for us to do a public hearing. You might want to ask the road agent if. There are any other trees, like on Garney, I think it's a scenic road, whether he's got any others that he's got his eye on. Maybe we just take care of them all at once. Okay. But I'll, I'll, t I'll speak with the road agent. My guess is that Garney was paved recently enough that he probably took care of everything what, five years ago whenever it was paved. But right. Life and shit to be paved, so. Right. Okay, that being done, review and certification of the amended zoning ordinance as approved by vote at the town meeting. These were our zoning ordinance that were on the ballot. Private road, driveways. Mr. Chairman, if I, yes. if I may, um, the uh, document that's entitled Proposed Zoning Ordinance Amendments 2016, that's the, um, the document that was left out here for the public. Um, and what I incorporated was pages of the zoning ordinance 
that had been changed or amended, um, and they are highlighted accordingly, and they match up with this proposal and ordinance amendments 2016 page exactly in the order that, that they are there. Okay, so you have them plugged in already? Yes, I have plugged in, and, and I also have a signature page should the planning board decide to accept that this is as the town meeting had voted. Okay. These all did pass, right? Um, Mr. Chairman, I also have the, um, yes. if I may, yep. I have the um, official warrant ballot as placed on the um, on the website. Question on the ballot? Yeah, correct. As Sorry. a summary, as a well, just, I just want to make sure we're talking about the same thing. Yeah. That is a summary of each of these, right? Each of those, if you look at the ballot, of course, it's a summary, right? That's correct. Yes. The summary was based on this detail. No, I, I remember. Right. So, I think we'd want to make sure that we were consistent with what we told people we were going to do, which was the detail that we provided to support. George, on the first, on page 44 of 56, uh, and these are nitpicks, but it's probably easier to deal with them now than later. Um, the, the numbers, one, two, three, are a little too far left. If you look at our other examples in, in that section, for example, uh, uh, item KK, mount, it has a uh, four, a list of four things under it there those numbers are lined up with the text of the definition the formatting error. yeah so i mean really mi minor but it's a little too far to the left right it shouldn't it should be the left side of the list should be even with the left side of the <laughs> definition above yes if you look at the what we handed out those numbers are scooched a little to the left at least that's what it looks like to me. Um, and then on page six of 56, George, the H, it looks like there's a space in front of it. It's not lined up with the G above it.
Mr. Chairman. Also on 6 and 56, the uh, 56 is no space. Good. No space? There's no space after of. I think there's an extra oh. space before the of. Thank you. If you look at like 44, 50, look at the flip back one. No, I, I see what you mean now. So it looks like 6 is the extra space. Yeah. That's weird. Now you got me looking <laughs> Well, the thought is, you recall the body of water, when we talk about being specific to Kingswood Lake? For frontage definition? Uh, no, I think we intentionally made frontage vague well, because if, you, there are two, if I recall, Diane's going to correct me if I get this wrong, because I know she probably remembers. <laughs> there are two places where we refer to frontage in the building lot requirements section, right. and there they specify more specifically which kind of frontage, whether it's on Kingswood Lake or on a road. Okay. So we can just leave it general there because it's always going to be qualified. Right. So something more specific in the zoning. Yeah, let's I mean, probably find that pretty quickly, right? Building lot requirements is <coughs> right up front. Um. So all lots shall have not less than 250 feet of frontage. So that generic, so think about the generic definition yes. on a class five or approved private road. All right, so that's one use of frontage. And then we have lots fronting on Kingswood Lake. So it's specifically frontage on Kingswood Lake. Okay. Could I have a... Uh Motion to accept the amended zoning ordinance approved at the town meeting. Uh, before we do that, Diane had her hand up. Oh, yes. I was just, I had no correction to what Rob just said about the body of water, um, but I will add my two cents worth. My recollection is that we discussed that, when we discussed that, we looked it up, Webster's or there was some online dictionary define it that way, and it was it was generic enough uh, that seemed to be acceptable. Okay. So that was the, my two cents for it. Thank you. You ready for a motion? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think what the motion should be. Um, I move that we, uh, I'm sorry, George, do we certify or we certify and then we have the, then we send it to the town clerk for, that's not the certification, it's us that's, okay. Mr. Chairman, I move that we certify the amended zoning ordinance with the noted typographical corrections. A second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Do we certify these? You know, uh, yes. Um, Mr. Chairman, also I have the attached uh, zoning ordinance with the corrections, the whole zoning ordinance with those corrections already in it, with of course with the exception of the typographical errors. And here is the uh, the page for certification. Okay. <clears throat> is this calling for dates or is that signatures? signatures? The, the older the previous one has signatures there. Yes. Um, may I uh, ask that this uh, revised document, when it's officially blessed, whatever the word is, um, by the town clerk, 
um, then make its way onto the website, town website. The um, zone ordinance is out on the website, right? But the corrected version. Yes. Or the adopted, newly adopted version. Is the adopted, it's not on there right now, right? No. No, because it's already been certified. Yeah. Okay, once, once, once we certify and the town clerk accepts, please put them on the website. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, also, uh, if you need me to, I will. But no. Okay. Copies are. You are yeah, so copies are supposed to go to the town clerk. Well, the town clerk has to put her signature on as well. And then town clerk gets a copy, OEP, Stratford Regional. Uh, Planning Commission and Town Council all get copies. We all, each of us, needs a copy for our binders. Um, and the town website, obviously, we just wanted to mention, has to get copies. Are there other places that George needs to send this? I'm not aware of any, but that our rules of procedure actually lays out exactly what's supposed to happen. Hopefully, it's aligned with what we just said. But. Says to find it, but our that page that we just signed right. has everything on there except for the website and our books. So, so you include our books on the website, too. yes. Thank you. Home occupation. Is that something that we were going to add something on gravel pits as home occupations? I, I don't recall. I, I noticed in the minutes it said that you had asked George to put it on the um, agenda. We were I, don't, I, I mean, I recall it came up, but I just don't remember what the context was. We were talking about home occupations that many people have, and there are some exclusions to home occupations. We don't allow gas stations, <laughs> auto repair, dog kennels, uh, there were a few of them in there. Fraternity and sorority houses. Yes. And we were going to add gravel pit. We have two, actually it looks like we have two lists. On page two of 56, um, there are, the following are examples of businesses which are not home occupations or home-based business. Animal hospitals and boarding kennels, automobile service, or filling stations, sales or repair facilities, boarding house, convalescent home, dormitory, fraternity or sorority house, hotel, in lodging or rooming house or other similar home or structure. And then on page Four of 56, we have non-permitted uses, animal hospitals, boarding kennels. It's basically re sort of reiterates that same list, plus restrict, uh, plus funnel development and anything else that's not consistent with A1. So maybe, maybe, maybe we could just say, it's, I mean, we have to <coughs> most of the list in two places. You can't do it as a home occupation. You can't just, you just can't do a period. Right. Um, I'm not sure why we have the list twice, but. So putting that in as uh, not allowing gravel pits as home occupation, that doesn't affect the gravel pits that we already have, correct? Well, anything we do can't affect something. something I mean, it, it, everything is inherently grandfathered. Okay. So we could put it actually under non-permitted uses if you want it. Yeah. Or if the people want it, right? Because there, it's a zoning ordinance so that will have to be on the ballot next year. But... 
Okay. Or, or we could put it in both places since that's what it seems like. If, you, if you're thinking that somebody would do it as home occupation, which they certainly might want to. Um, well, that was, the whole, that was the whole idea that someone could do that as a home occupation. Yeah. I'll call it a home occupation. How could it be a home occupation, though? Well, home occupation is um, an endeavor at home that has less than four employees. That's secondary to the primary use of either residential or agricultural. Or probably just residential because it's home, right? So, so you, you could conceivably start a gravel pit in your backyard? Too. Yes. Um, you know, we have, so uh, why don't you want people to have gravel pits? And I'm not, I mean, I'm just trying to drill down to what is it specifically about that use that you don't like? Um, scarification of the land, environmental uh, impact. Noise, uncharacteristic of a historic and um, agricultural use of the town. So we're that that last one we have under home occupation already, right? It's uh, item six. The residential agriculture character of the district shall be maintained. So, can't have a home occupation that violates that already. Um, we have, I think it's Article, Article Three, General Provisions, has a list of other things that you can't do: motor vehicle junkyards, private junkyards, places of storage or discard machinery, boats, blah blah blah. It also, uh, was it D? D, any uses that may be objectionable or injurious by reason of the production of emissions of odor, dust, smoke, refuse matter, fumes, noise, vibration, or similar conditions. So I'm, I'm, I'm just asking the question because, you know, maybe it's already covered. Right. You know, the, 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 the you know. Well, I don't, I don't want to clutter the whole zoning <laughs> ordinance up with um, cans and cannots and allowed and not allowed. If the board feels that we're already covered, let it alone. Well, I mean, we already have a bunch of things that you might think are covered, but that are called out explicitly. Um, but I don't, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm opposed to the, to the, pr the post proposed amendment. I'm just hoping that we'll at least think about whether we really need need it, or that we think it's already covered. Yeah. And I would also think that if the residents of Brookfield thought it so egregious that someone was going to have one, and they feared that to that great degree, that they would put in the Warren article. Because if you read the ordinance, it, it, it doesn't say you can't have one, but it basically says you still have to do certain things. So why would we be triggering a Warren article, not the public, if nobody said anything? That's my opinion. Yep. Diane? Um, I thought that in preparing for this meeting, I thought that I had run across something in our documentation, and I thought it was in the zoning, and I can't find it now, that speaks to um, excavations. Um, but flipping through the book, we, we have the excavation regulations um, that are, have already been adopted. And the very first um, sentence says that under Chapter uh, 155E, the all mining and excavation operations obtain prior approval and permit from the local um, municipality in which the operation is to occur. So if anyone were to want to 
begin a new gravel pit or start mining for granite or whatever, they'd still have to come and go through the permitting process, presumably. And it's permitted, so they'll get a permit. Uh, well, I'm not a quick enough reader to read through this whole <laughs> section, and, and, and I don't remember what all the details were that, uh, you know, that, that, well, actually there is a whole section here on planning board shall not grant a permit, and then it has A through I. So, I, I, I don't have a strong opinion one way or the other, I'm just pointing out that we already have a permitting process which isn't to say that everyone who wants to do it would be permitted to do it. Okay. I would think, I would hope that's what the permitting process is for, is to screen them. But. Okay. Um, I agree that I feel that there's coverage with what we already have to not add more non-use for home occupation in our zoning. That seems to be the consensus. Well, I'd also point out, if, if you don't mind, just real quickly, somebody could have a, a gravel pit that doesn't make a lot of dust, that doesn't make a lot of noise, that doesn't create a giant scarred landscape, right? I think, and as a, in the context of home occupation, you'd sort of think of, this is some guy's side thing, right? Or one of five jobs he's working or whatever. And you know, maybe it doesn't have a huge impact. But if we say you just can't do it, then that means that that person can't do it, even if they would do it in such a way that it didn't bother their neighbors, which is really what the zoning's about, right? It's, it's protecting the environment and not bothering your neighbors, right? right? And so um, one other thought is that the, the permitting process shouldn't be arbitrary, right? It should be some, something objective, right? You don't wanna, it's, it's really bad I think it's really bad when the people who happen to be sitting on the board at a given point in time um, have so much latitude that they can just decide they don't like somebody and therefore reject their permit application right, or something like that. It should be based on the A through I criteria or whatever. You know, it should be based on something that's part of the, the regulation that, that, you know, anyway. I. Um, I think that if we, you know, we don't want the home occupation to be abused, but if we can give, the more latitude we can give people to be, re, you know, assuming that they're going to be reasonable, um, and we have something to do, if, have some way of saying that, that they're not being reasonable, you know, to, and stop them, I, I'd be okay with leaving things the way they are. Any more discussion? Well, while we're on it, if you don't mind. Yeah. So I, I would just question the list that we've got. Yeah, we just, we just talked about briefly about adding another one. Should we remove any that are there? Right, or, or do we think that those are reasonable? Right, animal hospitals and boarding kennels. That's, um, that's a subject for a different time. We're talking about gravel pits. Well, it says home occupation on the... Uh, on the business. Yeah, if you don't want to talk about it, we can, t we can leave it for another time, but I, I, mean, I don't think it's going to be a long discussion. I just, you know, that one, you know, that one in particular, I'm not sure I understand right. why that's there. Well, let's, let's talk about it. Which one counts? Hospi animal hospitals and boarding kennels. Well, so maybe I can start by maybe my next door neighbor, pre, uh, who used to live there. His son now lives there. He was a dog breeder, right? Right. Wine runners. Those things can bark. Yeah. And I'm I'm far enough away that we would hear them, but it wasn't a nuisance. But I know that the neighbors around there were not happy, and. The state does have a regulation that says you can't have your dog barking for more than 30 minutes, I believe, continuously. Really? And... You know, the, someone looked into that? Uh, my dogs will bark from time to time, and I've educated Wakefield 
police on what the RSAs are, and I've asked them to write to, to tell my neighbors what they are. But I mean, our, my dogs will bark for maybe five or ten minutes. We get annoyed, we bring them in. But what um, Nate, my, na my neighbor, would do is he'd he'd like rotate them in the yard, right? So he'd have some dogs out there for 15, 20 minutes, and they'd bark and go crazy and everything else. And he'd call them in and send the next group out, <laughs> right? And so, you know, any one dog wasn't barking for more than half an hour. I don't know what the, I don't know what the end game is on whether that violates the state regs or not. The neighbors weren't happy, and I I, I get that, right? It's just I mean, yep. very loud, and I can see that maybe a boarding kennel might have that aspect to it because you're going to run the dogs and let them have some time outside their cage and stuff like that. Um, I, I don't know about animal hospitals though, whether animal hospitals are inherently loud. Well. But, the breeding of the dogs, home occupation, that's, that's not either. Well, that's allowed, I think. It's, it's not, not listed as an exception. It's not, it's not listed as an exception, true. The kennels, uh, boarding kennel is, uh, is a facility where people bring their dog to stay for the day. Mm -hmm. So that could be any number of dogs, and that could be loud, like um, you discussed the uh, next door breeder was. So I can understand how that is in there. What I would question is why they're treated differently. They have the same, whether I own the dog or whether somebody owns, else owns the dog and brings the dog for a period of time to my place, is that, does it really matter? Should, should boarding kennels and dog breeders be treated the same, given that they have the same sort of large number of dogs, there's gonna be, inherently there's gonna be noise, Issues. There's going to be potentially waste issues. Maybe I don't know. I mean, I don't know, right? I just don't. I don't understand why they necessarily be treated differently. I'm not advocating that we should that everyone should have a dog breeder or a dog kennel next to them because it's pretty disruptive. But you know, maybe dog breeders. Well, it's usually one one litter. Well, I, I don't know. I don't want to regulate it. If you're doing it as your business, right? If that's your livelihood, right. It, it, it's not one litter at a time, you know. I mean, you've got multiple dogs you're breeding them. Just like if you were farming, right, and you're growing livestock, you're not going to have one pregnant sheep a year, you know. It's anyway. I, so you want to ask that more than? I, I'm not bothered by it. I mean, I don't anticipate it's going to bother me. But you know, somebody I could see somebody coming up with that. But I'm at animal hospital. I'm not sure what the issues there are. Right. Um, I know, I know sick animals stay over the night at the hospital, but usually right. aren't they in, inside in a cage sedated? Or, I mean, I don't know. No, I don't know. Animal hospitals are 24 7. Veterinarian offices, regular business office. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, I'm, if I were a vet, I might say, hey, I want to be able to be a vet out of my, out of my house as a home occupation. I don't know. That one I'd question. Okay. I mean, boarding kennels and uh, breeding, still, doesn't the law already handle if there's a problem? The law already says you can't let your dog bark for 30 minutes. So if somebody is breeding dogs and the dogs are barking more than 30 minutes, there's already a statute in place to stop that from happening. Right. So why would we add that and add another prohibition? Somebody, if, if the person can't... Letting the dogs bark. We well, why are they letting it keep happening? The, the law enforcement. Why is the statute not kicking in? So there should be a way of stopping it. Well, what if the statute says no one dog can bark for more than half an hour in a row, but each dog can bark for twenty minutes <laughs> five times a day, and there's fifty dogs, right? I, I'm I'm that's, playing that's devil's advocate, but sorry, you know. That's why we have judges to judge these things. But this is what often happens is everybody winds up putting their judgment into an ordinance and then 50 years down the road, we can't do anything anymore. I, if, it, if it became such a problem again, someone in town would change the ordinance. It would have to go to a vote and it would be changed. Was there a uh, problem in the past? Does anyone recall? With Animal hospitals, uh, boarding kennels. It's been, it's been there since I got to town. I don't know. Now, what I would say about 
Uh, but I'm sorry, before you go on, so the case of my next door neighbor, right? Even if his neighbors got together and got the ordinance changed, he'd be grandfathered. He'd be able to keep doing what he was allowed to do before the ordinance change. So uh, I think they'd have a good case that that hit, that activity was a nuisance mm -hmm. under general provisions D or whatever I just read, mm -hmm. right? Just as a noise thing. Um, so, but I, I could also envision a dog breeder who maybe there's a breed of dog that doesn't bark, right? Or they've got a big they they have you know uh, what's the like next door they have the, the the riding ring. Imagine if they decided to be dog breeders and instead of riding the horses inside all the time, they let the dogs run inside, right? And then nobody's going to hear them barking even if they right. So I could imagine somebody being a breeder or a kennel in such a way that it doesn't influence their neighbors, but they're prevented from doing it now under our, you know, the kennels under our ordinance, so. Well, as long as the ZBA. <laughs> yes. Now about the animal hospitals, now you could change that to clarify, it could be animal hospitals without a boarding facility attached to it. You could change that, so you could still have an animal hospital, but it seems so like. So board of adjustment? Sure. Thank you. I'll pass. I have one point. So when we're talking about well, ducks. kennels, <laughs> they can be loud. Um, I'm trying to understand how dogs fall under agricultural character. Is a dog considered an agricultural animal? Like yeah, it's, cows or it's it's a, I think it's a residential animal. It's it's part of the residential aspect of it. You have sheep dogs. You're breeding yep. sheep dogs. So, so working working animals are. Are your dogs considered um, on your account of four employees? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. That's a good question. But working dogs are specifically called out in the RSAs, separate, and they're allowed to bark as much as they want. They're. I swear to you, they. They are, if they're working dogs, whether they're a guard dog or like a herding dog, they're allowed to, they're, you know, allowed to be out and about and making noise 24-7. Is that why your dogs bark? Do you have those type of dogs? <laughs> My one dog that barks, wait, they are herding dogs. The one, the one that barks, he thinks he's working. He's a, he's a little confused. <laughs> he barks at the woods and the coyotes and stuff, right? So. And the light, the, the red light on the tower. On top of the when the leaves fall, he just goes crazy. He gets used to it by spring. But, um, but when I hear that, I get alarmed and I call because I'm like, what's going on down there? Something could be happening. You could have red, fallen red light down. Alert. You, hear, you hear him. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, he's not a quiet dog, but I'm not annoyed yet. <laughs> he's getting old. He'll, he won't be around for long. Any replacement plants? Oh gosh. No. <laughs> too, we've got too many dogs. Okay. The discussion. Things like the filling station, I get because those are environmental, right? I mean, that's the, uh, the argument against the service of filling stations is that they're notoriously leak crap into the ground. Is that. They all don't leak. Yeah, they do. Eventually they do. I don't know why. I think they're just being um, anti-automotive service industry. Okay. Keep thinking. <laughs> do, you, do you want to? You want to? They're all going to die someday too. You want a gas tank like next to your well? No. Yeah. So, Mr. Chairman, basically, anything that's not permitted, you can go to the zoning board of adjustment. That's right. So. Let's move on. Inspection dates of gravel pits. Judge, did, did you put an inspection date into our calendar? Um, you, you're talking about the the, uh, the new document for. Uh, I'm sorry. Did you give us a calendar that's blind right now? The activities of the document you're asking about. That one. Yeah. Uh, I did not put it in there because it, it had not been, it, it's not even a working document yet, so. 
Can we make that a working document? Mr. Chairman, I move that we make the recurrence activities of the planning board document a working document. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Reoccurring activities of the planning board. The first one we want to put on here is gravel pit inspection. Yes. Mr. Chairman, is there another way we can format this? There are things that may have to be done, you know, like on a calendar, a recurring every year. Right. Should we use a calendar as the format to show the date? That has to be done, so it's won't be missed. Well, I think just we would just idea. put which month, you know. June, we're going to put on here. I'm guessing something like June. You know, uh, assign somebody to do the gravel uh, gravel pit inspections, and then August, you know, re, you know, report to you know gravel pit, pit ins inspection report or something like that. Right. These and should these activities should relate to. The planning board meeting of the month we want it done. That way we can assign it at the meeting. It comes up on the calendar. We assign it and it's reported back the next meeting. Yeah, I mean, this basically, I think we, George could take a look and say, oh, I'm doing the May agenda. Let me pull out the three things that are on here, two things on here that are May, and then get them on the agenda, right? Right. And, um, and with the gravel pit, we may end up with two items, one for Assigning somebody to do it, and another one for them to report back, right? So, True. so it's. Um, Does that answer your question? Your I'm just over, I'm overthinking. Me. I'm always thinking graphic artists. So I'm always thinking. You know, I want to see. I want to see a calendar, and I want to see a dot on June second. But that's just me talking. This works too. So, on the gravel pit inspection. Some months are better than others. Like this month will be a bad month. There's a lot of mud out there. Um, when you get into the summertime, a lot of foliage is in, so it's more difficult to survey landscapes or look at look at landscapes, looking for erosion, etc. Anything else that that might occur. So, what month in the board's mind would be? The best time to inspect the gravel pit. <coughs> I, I thought we discussed June as an appropriate month, May or June. I, I don't know. I, I'd have to go back through my notes. I think Gary was advocating for that. Yeah, if I recall, I think um, Eddie Nason mentioned June too. So maybe we assign it in, in May? Assign in May. And then get a report in July? Report in June, so okay. the third week. So we'll sign on the uh, third week of May and get the report back the third week of June. Okay. So we put in uh, May. Sign gravel pit inspection. June. Report gravel pit inspection. And what's the third column? Regulation. Is that like a reference to an RSA that causes us to want to do that? I, I was think the reason I used the word uh, regulation instead of RSA is some something going on up on this list are basically requirements that we have in, in our rules of procedure that may not be in the RSA. So I just threw that in. So this should be an RSA, right? Yeah, it was 155, 155E, 155E. This 
document it says 155E. I just want to, that might be enough. <laughs> Is 155E the whole yeah, it's gravel the, pit the whole ground, yeah. Up? yeah. Um, George, this inspection report form, this is going to end up as an appendix, I would assume, in rules of procedure. Um, maybe we want to reference that as well. So rules of procedure, appendix, whatever it ends up being, Q, or I don't know what we're on now. But um, Is it already in? No, it's right here. But George will, when we get to the point of a motion to for George to put it in there, he'll assign it with whatever the next, I would assume the next appendix number letter. Okay, we're going to get to that. So, George, will you fill in the... Um Assigned gravel pit inspection and report gravel pit inspection for May and June. Yes. On the recurrent recurrent activities of the plan board. Yes. Bring that out again next meeting. Yes. Okay. Old business. Gravel pit inspection form. You're already on it, right? I'm there, man. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the our minutes that we just approved did have a list of things that we'd asked. Has the what the form looked like before? I'll take it out of 55E, right? Well, I mean, it had so on the back of the minutes, I believe there was. There's the, the form as it existed at the last meeting, right? right? Which was just the five items. And then um, on page two of six at the bottom on uh, item F, we had a list of things that we'd asked George to change. So it, at date, map, lot, et cetera. Um, I believe uh, all of those have been done. And I guess we could review that. Yes. Um, I don't have any particular comments. It looks good to me. Um, I'm not sure that we, I don't think we attack whether or not these are the right five things to have. We're probably going to add a bunch of stuff with them. Yeah, didn't we talk about um, owner of record instead of just map and lot? You know, the minutes, we probably did talk about it. The minutes say map and lot. But that leads directly to who the owner is. Changes appear to be included in the form now. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I'd like to make a suggestion um, based on Ed's concern earlier. If I were to take this form and go on to somebody's site and do an inspection, I'd prefer to know who the person is that I'm going to be speaking with. The map and lot doesn't clearly define who I would be speaking with as the, the owner. I see. Yeah, the other reason why I mentioned that was because let's say there's a, a negative report generated, I believe we're going to have to have correspondence with that person, so it should be, it should be the owner of record that we're going to be going back and forth with. I agree. I think we should add that. Right. Is there a possibility that the, that might not be the same person that's present for the inspection, though? Is it, so, David, are you suggesting that you should have the name of the person that's there on site, or or an agent? That's what I mean. Is the owner or the agent? And I I don't know. I'm not sure what what you what your intent was, um, and then. 
relative to what Ed said. I'm a little confused, so you guys need to do good up. <laughs> well, I, I would think that it should say owner of record or agent of the owner. That way, you just have you have someone. There, there was a record that who you spoke to when you went out there. Like if yep. the person that owns the gravel pit is somewhere in Massachusetts, but he's got somebody or she's got somebody working at the pit, then that person has the authority to speak for the owner in record. I would think. I don't know if agent is the right word. Is it? Yeah. So. Uh, we should put that line right above inspectors. Or slash agent underneath uh, map and lot. It's just a fill in, it's a place to fill it in. If there's nobody there, then it's blank. Right. <laughs> so, also before you just remember, the, I think the process is going to be that some, you got to call somebody. You gotta you gotta contact somebody and arrange for access. But this that's not what this is. If this is the report that you're gonna file, so there's other legwork that you gotta do. You know. So would that go on the calendar? Notify owner. May. So I I would think our rules of procedure. I mean, probably better on the rules of procedure if we had a procedure for this. Right. You know, so somebody gets assigned this, they can go and see what they're supposed to do. Oh, I've got to find who it is, who, did, who you know, contact the owner, get access, fill out the report. Right. And um, I don't think our rules of procedure really say anything about that right now. So currently, there's nothing in the rules and procedure about gravel pit inspections. Right? Not as far as I know. Is there anything in the rules of procedure saying that the gravel pits must that we have to have a record that it's a gravel pit. Who owns it? With the permit, we have the on the permit it does. But yeah. we have we have a document that defines that permitting process. So presumably somewhere George has some records that from some prior year that you know, who these pit owners are and, and such. The reclamation plans, things like that. If I can ask that, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Yeah, those those records, um, those reclamation plans and permits um, are actually located in the CEO's office in, in, in that, those files. Okay. And and this and anyone who has such a um, excavation has to also apply yearly to the state too. Right. The, that to the state, uh, the yearly application is an intent to excavate or something yes, like that? Yes, that's the way I understand it, yes. So, they, so they, if they do not intend to excavate that year, then I understand that they do not have to apply to the state. That's correct. Right, but that's abandoning their excavation and they lose their grandfathering. I, I, don't, I don't think that that is abandoning it. I think because there is, if, if, I mean, I'm just going by memory, but the way I understood it was that that it's still regarded as an as a excavation site. It's just that they're not they're they're not applying for excavating that particular year. But I, I could be wrong about that. Okay, so in the rules of procedure, it's pretty simple. All we need is a section that says gravel pit inspection and planning board representatives will inspect gravel pits. On a yearly basis. And this form becomes an appendix, right? Right? Mr. Mr. Chairman, also, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't want to <clears throat> provide any redundant information, but the, the act excavation application form that's listed with the earth excavation and restoration regulations that we have, um, does have the top, submit completed application together with additional required information to chairman or secretary. It does have data submission, it has owner of applicant, 
location of proposed existing excavation, etc. So I don't know if that has any bearing on what we're talking about so far. Let's, let's add something into the rules of procedure for gravel bit inspection. Who's going to draft that? We're going to draft that here, or you want somebody yeah, to do it this one? Let's draft the right ones. There's going to be a sentence, right? Maybe. Gravel, the, the section of the rules of procedure charge would be gravel pit inspection. And it should, it should say that gravel pits uh, will be inspected by the planning board. Uh, annual inspection of gravel pit of the planning board, by the planning board, pursuant with RSA 155E. Then we've got site visits, meetings, um, conceptual, preliminary conceptual cons consultation, pre application design review, site plan review, applications, and so on. Um, do you want to put it like right before that? So, right before amendments? Yes. Mm -hmm. I'll fill in nicely, push that. Balance that page right on. So, George, I think that uh, Rick is proposing to make the new section room numeral 20 on page, right now it would fall on page 18 of 19. Do we have to reference the appendix? I think I think we should, you know, say that you know something to the effect of that annually we, you know, planning board does annual inspections of all active gravel pits. Period. Pursuant to 155E, and um, to uh, I guess the second second thing would be to that the uh, chairman appoints planning board members to do the inspections. Third thing would be, uh, just trying to outline this, I'm not, this yeah. isn't exactly the right words, but the third thing would be that um, they, the, to, the, the inspection should be scheduled with the owner or his agent. Yeah. And then the third thing should be that when they're done, or fourth thing should be when they're, after the inspection, fill out the report and file it and present it back to the planning board, I think. So is that all the things they need to do? That's it. I think we want to make sure that it's clear that they need to get owner's permission. We don't need a future board to not, to go rogue and, you know. Trespass. Yeah, make, yeah, make, make somebody unhappy un, unnecessarily. No, we don't want that. It's easy enough to um, notify and beat somebody. Yeah, that George is that? Can I think so? Yes. Do you, uh, do you need more guidance, or do you think you can wrap some better words around those ideas? Um, I I think I, I got a good handle on. Thank you. Okay. I'll and, and that'll show up at the next meeting. Yes. Should we, Mr. Chairman, should we yes. do something like a notification, like when the date comes up, we? send out a letter noticing when the inspection is going to be done? Yeah, I think so. Um, but in writing? Yeah, come May we'll probably send a letter out. Just 
when we schedule the appointment. Well, if you want me, if you want the letter to be part of the procedure, you should add that as one of the items that George is going to write up there, right? <laughs> Provide notice and then con you know get in touch with them to, to schedule the exact date and time, right? Right. That way, if uh, if for instance we notice somebody, no one returns any mail to us, then we have something to you know to stand on if we have to go in another direction. Okay. It's, it's going to notify that there's going to be an inspection of the pit on such and such a day. And then we send that out. That should take care of it, right? Well, unless they can't, aren't available on that day. Right? Shouldn't we, I mean, these are our neighbors. Shouldn't we just, like, talk to them and find a good time? I mean, I don't think it's bad idea to send a letter saying, hey, we're going to reach out to you and schedule an inspection. They know what's happening. They know that the person's calling them up, you know, is <coughs> living in it or something. I don't know. But, I mean, if they don't show up, I don't think we can just go on the property. All right. Hey. Uh, I'm sorry. I was trying to look at something. I might have missed this. Um, is this activity going to be the planning board member who's assigned to do this work? Or is this the planning board? going to be doing this work. I thought I heard initially that you, you'd you appoint a planning board member and then basically it becomes that person's responsibility and then just outlining what those steps are, is that correct? The chair will appoint two planning board okay. to uh, inspect the pit for the, the pits for that year. So then this is this is rules of procedure for those two planning board members, right. not the board itself to okay. Right. Thank you for that clarification. But it sounds like that, you know, one option would be that, you know, the board, the administrative assistant would send a letter. Is right. that that's what I mean that would be something that would be done. Yeah. Not by those. The, the plan the planning board member will, will do inspection. The notification, everything will come through the uh, System. That way he's he's got access to the phones and the names and everything and could set up the appointment. Right. So we'll probably once we in May we we'll we'll, we'll sign the inspectors and then that week George will um, on the following week George will make the arrangements with the owner and we'll set up a date. Should be pretty easy. Now, what do we do in the event that there is no response? This is just for the future. What happens if there is no response from someone? What's our What's going to be our policy? I, I just heard someone say that if we don't hear anything back, we'll just go there and inspect it. I don't think we should be trespassing on someone's property. So I don't know how we'd handle that. I think we'd have to read 155E carefully and see if it tells us that we can go on their property if we, you know, w without their permission for this inspection. And if it comes up, you know, worst case, we have to, you know, call the attorney and ask what to do. Spend some money, right? I, I agree with your sentiment that we shouldn't just willy-nilly go on people's property. Well, I think of safety also. I mean, you know. It, I wouldn't want to be going on somebody's property just because they didn't because if they didn't if they didn't write back. Maybe they don't want you on their property, and we're going to send some planning board member over there to go trample over somebody's property. And somebody's going to get shot. Well, might be current news. And if I'm carrying, I don't know how that's going to work. I <laughs> walk around with a gun on my property, so that well, yeah. makes you safer, right? Mm -hmm. So. We'll just look carefully for the gun-free zone signs. Act yeah, right. No guns there. We're going to get rid of that. <laughs> I hope so. Are we okay with this? So did, excuse me, Mr. Chairman, did, did you want me to also see about drafting a possible letter of notification? Yes. We've got another appendix. 
Is it the appendix is thicker than the rules of procedure? Well, that's fine. I mean, it makes it makes the job going forward that much easier because you don't have to think. You just have to pull out the right <laughs> appendix. Mr. Chairman, what's the uh, what's the time interval that they're given to respond to the request? Are we doing this thirty days in advance, or what? What's the amount of time? Because I'm thinking, if we send a letter out, they don't respond within, let's say, ten days. Then perhaps we can send another letter out, so at least we can show that there were two attempts. That's a good question. So what is it? Is it going to be ten days, seven days, thirty days? I just think we should think about. It. Well, we, I, want, we want the inspection to occur in June. That's pretty important. When it's, when it's dry and we can see. Uh, as far as people not responding to the notification of inspection, I, I, I can't answer that right now. Diane? Perhaps if, I, I know that we had I think we had talked about May and June as the, the time frame on the list. If we backed that up for April for the administrative portion to start um, and had the notice go out you know, to the owners, and I, I don't know how to address Ed's question, um, but that would add, instead of rushing, you know, in between the May meeting you know, start the process and oh geez, nobody's answering and and then everybody's scrambling to get the result by June. If perhaps the notification and in that notification maybe for the owner to contact George and then can, then George can connect them with the planning board member. Right. And maybe then by the May meeting things will be coalescing to actually set up the inspection between the individuals. So send out the notification much earlier. I would suggest maybe thinking about doing that in April, just as a heads up, yep. and that gives a month yep. for mm -hmm. something to transpire, communications, and how many times, that doesn't address Ed's question again of okay. how many efforts are made to contact them. That's, I don't know how to answer that. Yeah, if you start early and then inform the gravel pit owner that in June, sometime in June, is the date that it'll be inspected. That way if we started in April, if we just came up with that time period that they have to respond somehow. Seven to ten days or just so we can get two notices if we have to right. before June, well before it. That's probably a good idea. Yeah. Ten, right? Ten, ten calendars. So so George will draft up the notification and in, um, in the next meeting we'll make sure that it's uh, the way we want it before we go home and have it sent out. And then on a calendar we could have it go out the 1st of April every year thereafter. We'll be a little short this year. There's only two. Yeah. I, I wouldn't, I understand what you're, I think I understand what you're saying about them responding. My expectation would be that they're not going to respond. And then we should just, just plan on having George call them, right? And just maybe that, that letter just is, hey, we're going to be doing inspections. Here's what, you know, you know, the last week of May, we're probably going to be reaching out to you to, to schedule a time that and we'd like to get it done in the first two weeks of June. And... Please call George. Please email George. Whatever, but don't ex you know don't expect them to. But it'd be great if they could at least tell us, reach yeah. out to us, and tell us what their phone number is, right? right? So George can get a hold of them easily or something like that. But yeah. um, I don't know that we we have plenty of time if somebody if we can't get a hold of somebody. You know, this is if we would like to get it done in June, but if it doesn't get done in June, we could do it in October, right? True. If we needed to, right? It'll, you know, maybe you'd be getting wet again, but, you know, at least the leaves would be falling. Anyway, I mean, these are our neighbors. We're going to, you know, we're going to get a hold of them, I think. And, and that said, it's always good to have this in writing and a procedure, even though, you know, we'll 
speak now, in the next maybe 10, 20 years, we might be able to easily get an inspection, but we, I'm thinking of the future when we're not here, we'll have that in there and then somebody can follow that because right. the same people are not going to be there. Yes, we could, as neighbors, just ask to, to inspect it, but I just think we should not rely on just, this is just the way we've always done it and not have anything in writing. Yeah, that's why that's we're, we're making an attempt at that now. Exactly. Uh, exactly. That's how we got jumped on it the last time. One, one of the planning board members said, you know, I'm supposed to be inspecting gravel pits. So that's why, you know, it's not written down, now there is. Making kind of things a little neater. Mr. Chairman, are you thinking that this uh, schedule that we're putting together um, is another append is that a, like an appendix on the rules procedure? Is that a another section in the rules procedure? Have you thought about that? What are you thinking as far as how? No, I haven't. I was thinking of it more just as a reference document. Just to throw this out there. Is there anything else that we inspect that we go out and inspect and maybe it could be put in that section? I don't recall if we do anything else. Radio towers and windmills. So we, we did have CIP and we did have a bunch of activities related to that, but I believe that we don't have CIP anymore. Correct. Oh, they, they trashed it. Oh, you Where have you been, man? <laughs> <laughs> don't you live here? It's on film. <laughs> oh, I, I, I was. I watched the first hour. I didn't see anything about it. I didn't finish it yet. But I was watching specifically for that to see if that passed. Was it close? I don't remember. I don't remember what the vote was, but I don't think so. I don't remember what the vote was either. But um, you'd like to vote yes. I'm certain that um, they just went with the recommendation that it doesn't make any sense to do it because we have so many different. Um, accounts that we use to, to do what we got to do. That's, oh, that's a couple more hours sleep for us. Yeah. But I mentioned the other inspection. If we had any other items like that, because that's where perhaps this could be. That's all. That's all. So they vote to put CIP as a function of the planning board. It gets swept under the rug for 13 years. As soon as we do it, the, the 86. I mean, is a CIP and a capital plan the same thing? What? Is a capital plan and a CIP the same thing? CIP stands for Capital Improvement Plan. Yeah. So it's, what did I say? Capital plan? No, I thought there was something else. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, we may want to consider. Um, expunging anything from the rules of procedure concerning the CIP, which is mm -hmm. the only place I know of is 17.2 under committees. I have a motion to expunge CIP. Well, let's take a look at what it says, because it might be that it can... Yeah, it says 17.2 Capital Improvement Program Committee and in parentheses, in the event such a committee is formed. So, um, yeah, I mean, I guess we could get rid of it. I mean, it's gonna, it's probably gonna, you know, probably be 20 years before the voters try again. But <laughs> someone might read that, let's get rid of it. So is there a motion? I second. Yeah. Was there a motion? Yes. Second, but it didn't get second at all. Any discussion? Sponging elements of CIP. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So just a procedural thing, Mr. Chairman, we can't change the rules procedure just willy-nilly. We've got to have written copies in people's hands. So I would suggest that we include that change with all these others yes. that we're working on as part of the working document. Just to be explicit about that this is, you know, that motion was to add that change to the working documents. Will you have that for us next time, Judge, so yes. we can 
see if it's coming out. Amending the rules of procedure about a notification form and other requirements. We have that here. George, we added the um, italicized. Um. Um, yeah, originally the italicized was added, and then afterwards those those that are underlined were added later on. Okay. George, are you tracking all of these changes to the rules procedure as one working document or several? No, this is one. I, I've always kept it every every time. <clears throat> there is, in other words, I'm keeping the original documents, and every time I'll, documents change, I'm keeping it in the computer, and then and then what happens is also it's in the minutes too because we keep in the originals in there. So what happens is um, this document has all the changes that are in there so far. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> uh, from a, from a you know a, a tracking and, appro and approval standpoint, are we are you keeping track of this as several working documents that are having no. changes to rules procedure, or just your logically it's one working document? It, we just added another pair, striking a paragraph related to CIP to that. Excellent question, um, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry, I, I, I've been speaking without without your permission, if I may. No, well, uh, I'm listening. Um, each time the, the working document is amended, you'll notice at the top that what, what happens is the date itself will change. Yep. So, so this is the revised edition as of November 19, 2015. Right. And we had, we had previous ones that were submitted had previous dates on them. So it's the same, the same word, uh, uh, working document, but a different revision. The, the reason I was asking is because this one says gravel pit working document or gravel pit inspection report working document. Yeah. And has a different date on it. I think that this is a change to the, ultimately, this will be a change to the rules of procedure. Yes. Right. So I'm, I guess I'm asking is this, are we tracking the gravel pit changes and the abutter notification changes sort of together and we're going to, approve those all at once, or we're tracking them separately, and we'll just probably to make you, keep you sane, we'll approve them all at once. I, I've been, I've been okay, to, to answer that specific question, okay, I, what I've been doing is, uh, you know, excellent question. I've been, um, uh, for instance, this one that says a butter notification form and other requirements, um, it, it probably should not be called ROP working document, because you, know, you said there's, there's, more than, there's more than one. This. This was the only one at that time, that's why I did that. And it should prop its name should probably be changed just so we don't have the problem that you just just stated. No, well, I mean they're they're labeled differently, so they look like they're different documents. Yes. So I don't think it's particularly confusing. I was just we're so we've got several working yes. documents that are all changes to the rules of procedure that's and correct. I think we've been holding on to this one, the a butter that's right. one for a while because there's a procedure that has to be followed and a lot of trees have to be killed to change the rules of procedure, right? Yeah, yes. So we've been holding on to this one because we know it's not critical and we've got other ones pending. And, and, and the, um, the, um, uh, the town clerk has to sign it each time it is amended. Yeah, we don't want to stress her out. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, they're, all, they're all starting to move in different uh, time and speed, so it should be separate. No, it's fine. I'm, I'm okay with that. I yeah. just, has this changed since the last time we saw it? No. No, we, we in, in the last meeting, it, um, the chairman decided to postpone this. I, actually, it, it was by your recommendation because of the same thing you just said. I think it looks ready to accept. Anybody, everybody look this over? Working document for a notification and other requirements? 
I think it's ready. Although as soon as we accept it, then George has to start killing trees and getting Virginia signed, right? It's going to happen. Right, I, it, well, but it's going to happen when we do the gravel pit as well. What are the with that one yet? Yeah. I understand. But should we can, can the abutter notification change wait a month or two? That's the question, right? If it can't, let's go ahead and kill the trees and get it done with, right? If it can, then maybe we're okay, right? So. Well, the abutters need to uh, get notified this month. But, but look at the change. True. The, 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 the change here is handling yeah. a case that has come up once in 50 years, right? Yeah. So, so don't want, do that for two months. So, is that the so we, can, we can put this on the back burner and wait for everything else to catch up with it? Is that what you're suggesting? That would be my suggestion just because I'd like to and then have save a little bit of money. a bunch of rules of procedures, working documents going at once. That was, that's what I'm thinking. But, I, I mean, there's... There's not, I don't think there's anything wrong with this particular one. I think it's ready to go. And if everyone wants it just to get done with, let's, let, you know, I, I certainly won't vote against that. I just think we can save a little bit of money by holding off. All right, it's gonna, it's gonna come up on all the business every week until it's, they're all together, right? Which will probably be next month. Okay, yes, can right. I suggest that we ask the uh, administrator assistant to put this one on the back burner, like not print a copy for us each time until we get to that point where yes. we we're, think we're we've got several, the other working documents have caught up. Yes. And if a brothers need to be notified in the meantime, judge will call an emergency session. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> All right, back to our So we covered um, a button on location, gravel pit inspection, and reoccurring activities. Mr. Chairman, under reoccurring activities of the planning board the uh, it's still in process the review of the changes to the planning and zoning changes legislatively so that's still in, in flux so what, what what when should we put let's put that on the schedule it's not on there this year this time oh you mean create do you mean create a rules of procedure in order to do that no, I was suggesting that we add an item to this page oh, okay. for to remind us to do it at the very least. Mr. Chairman, when do the books actually come out? What date? It should be as soon as we receive the books. When did it come out? It seems like we just got that done. I think it was January or December. Exactly. Yeah, time goes by very fast. Is that 2016 or is this kind of like windows? No, it's, it's called the 2015-2016 edition. For some reason I recollect it was January. Session and sometime the end of June. No, for last oh, year. Oh, when? When last does? Because if this this is this is for FY for sorry for 2015, so presumably it was done at the end of 2015. So I think David's probably right. It probably came out in January, and that might be a good time to just at least get it on the calendar. On our yeah. our calendar. I'm trying to think when we got the bill. Figure that out because that's that's the date that it would be. It can't be. You can't look at it when we stop creating legislation because I don't know when the Office of Energy and Planning gets the books out. Uh, well, the the preface from page Roman numeral three. Um, it says uh, 
uh, blah, 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 with decision dates up through September 25th, 2015. And the preface is dated December 2015. So my guess would be that they're publishing in December and we get it in, we, I think we probably got it in January. So schedule something for a January meeting. Some meeting for January. And if it turns out that it were February, then we can fine tune it next year. Yeah, and then it also would be a good idea to not just have somebody on the planning board compile all the changes, but there has to be at some point that the planning board sits down and together reviews it. Which doesn't take that long. Once the book is together, it's easy to read through it, but we should really review it before that year, you know. Give charge the wording for what you want on the calendar in January. And later, if you want to, like, well, we can review it, right? One for the to remind us to look at it, and the other to talk about it. But we can move these dates. Thank you. Thank you. But just to get something in there, because this is coming out. I mean, it should only take, depending on who's doing it, it should only take, you know, one meeting cycle to do it. It shouldn't take as long as it's taking me. But um, so January would be. January, February, the February meeting. It should be done by. Yeah. Okay. Now, we're, well, you. thank you. I, I came. I don't have it with me here, but I actually came up with a, a rules of procedure change that I wrote up that I've written up so it would go into the book somewhere. It basically says the format of it. Do you recall that I, that I brought that? It showed what format and how it was to be done. So if nobody's here, they'll know how to do it. Because if you, do, if you, just, say, if you just say review what's in the book here, it's almost impossible. You have to have the two books and you have to go through it to know the changes. Unless there's some other organization that I've not yet found that already does that. Mm -hmm. it, it's quicker if one person reviews it, does the bold, shows the before and after, and then the planning board just comes and looks at those items. We'd be here all night if we had to go right. through the, to the changes. So um, mid-February would be the, the date that it should be completed. Start date? The start date of the review yeah. of what the planning board would review. It could be any time after that second meeting. Or maybe it could be at the second meeting. Okay, so start date is February? The review and compiling of the changes should be done within the January, and then the review of the planning board should be that February meeting. So January begin, February review. Yeah. And that begin is assigning, making sure one person knows they're responsible for preparing it, right? Yeah, so I would say as soon as the books are handed out, which should be in January, um, that could change if the books don't arrive, but... We can't stop it before we get the book. So just swag a date, January. And next meeting I'll bring that, I'll bring that, um, the insert for the rules of procedure that just say it, it needs to be done. Yeah, because we'll just adopt that as a working document. Right. We'll go with, with these other ones. Okay. We return that to old business charge for next time. Okay. Member comments. Yes. I, I'm sorry. Were we, were we done with the recurrent activities of the planning board? Yep. Did you, did you let her add something if she wants to add it. <laughs> no, I, I didn't say the uh, 
<laughs> M, M word, yeah. It's so. all right. It's a working document. We'll go over it next time. You want to add something else? Um, we'll back up. Uh, no. No, that's fine. You can wait. Uh, actually, it would just I'd rather move on. But I do have another moment. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. We were eating some comments. We're back off. No <laughs> 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 <Number> comments. No <laughs> <laughs> <Number> comments. <laughs> yes. It has his hand up. <laughs> you are already into it, right? All right. Um, <clears throat> at the last meeting, as we read in the minutes, um, Ed and I were appointed to the. Um, to become the representatives to the, uh, or recommended to the selectmen to be members um, of the planning board representing Brookfield at the Regional Planning Commission. I did attend my first meeting on March 4th. That was the Transportation Advisory Committee. There was, um, it was a presentation, uh, almost the entire meeting was a presentation by Federal Highway on the FAST, they call it the FAST Act. It's the Fixing America's Service Transportation Act. Um, so it's the FAST Act. Um, I, I guess I'd been out of the loop. I was in, encouraging that finally, after years of continuing authorizations and a short um, uh, brief period called MAP 21, there is a five-year authorization for service transportation funding federally. Um, and it is the, the, the need to recognize that it's the authorization, it is not the annual appropriations, but the authorization is the ceiling for the annual appropriations by Congress to fund those programs. But the um, authorizations um, total over that five year period, $305 billion. Um, I'm just going to hit a couple of the highlights very quickly. The gas tax is insufficient to support the funding needs for transportation, uh, all of the transportation projects, and that $70 billion has been authorized to be taken from the U.S. Uh, Treasury General Fund because we're just driving more fuel-efficient cars and there's not as much gas tax. Um, it, the interesting thing that was new, and I've been, I've been involved in this process since Ice-T back in the early 90s, um, freight has been given recognition, albeit most of it is highway-based dollars related to freight, um, not necessarily um, rail. The Service Transportation Fund, which is typically what we recognize as highway money, in New Hampshire, um, has is now a block grant to New Hampshire, uh, to, to all the states. And I didn't get clarification on what they mean by that. I, I think what that means is that it used to be formula funding by regions, I believe, and now it's a block grant to the states. I think that also gives the states a little bit more latitude, but I don't know that for certain. And there are specific set-asides for um, CMAC, Congestion Mitigation Air Quality Funding, Transportation Alternatives, and as part of the Transportation Alternatives, there's a component for recreation or scenic trails, or excuse me, recreation trails and scenic roads. Um, and that made my ears perk up, um, especially later on in the meeting when there was a reference to uh, rec the recreation trail funding, thinking of the rail trail that runs through Brookfield, um, me, not, not that wasn't discussed, um, but that there would be another round of funding available this coming summer. So I started looking into it. Um, long story short, um, uh, it's a little complicated, uh, but I was disappointed to learn that um, it's funding that actually comes through um, the Department of, I keep calling, it's dread, and I can't for the life of me at the moment think of what it is, uh, that handles that particular part of transportation funds. And I've had discussions with um, various folks that have been involved in the rail trail. 
my thought on this, frankly, and I'll just blurt it out. I've, I've uh, had a conversation with Ernie Brown, who's been involved in the um, Wakefield, Brookfield track, which led to the improvements on the rail trail on the east end. Um, I had found it frustrating as a resident of Brookfield that I couldn't access the trail in the winter because there was no place to park my car. I had to go all the way down to Wakefield and ski all the way back to Clark Road and then a little bit further. And not a big deal, but there's a huge section, there's a long section, almost four miles long, between Clark Road and Cotton Valley Road going west um, that for people who are less athletic is essentially inaccessible. And it's also not improved, which is what the folks who I eventually talked to um, the ones that are working on the trail and have current grants are going to be continuing to improve. So, um, the long story short, though, on that is that they're not. So the grant round this year is not supporting any land acquisition or easements. It's like, okay, well, how can we get a parking lot with either one of them without those things? So, um, I'm going to continue to to be monitoring this and hope for ways to find. Uh, an opportunity to fund some improvements that might benefit the town of Brookfield and its residents. The other interesting thing that came out of this uh, presentation by FHWA was that <clears throat> um, under the design standards for federal from Federal Highway for bridges and highways, the wording has been changed. Uh, with respect to um, the way that I wrote it here, is it codifies and strengthens what they call context-sensitive design. Um, and that is, as projects are being planned, either roads or bridges, that the words may take into account um, natural environment, scenic, aesthetic, blah, blah, blah. Now is shall consider. So it is incumbent on the funding agencies, either the feds or through, through the state, to, they must consider natural environment, scenic, aesthetic, and other design criteria cost savings by using existing flexibility in current design guidance and regulations. And it also permits local jurisdictions to use design standards different from the state's design standards under certain conditions. I haven't had a chance to talk to Ed about this um, since I learned this, and I'm hoping that this may have an impact on the bridge projects that are um, coming up for, for Brookfield. So there is a meeting tomorrow. Where are you planning to go? Um, unfortunately, I have a, a scheduling conflict. I'll only be able to attend um, uh, the first part of the meeting. It's the policy committee of the, of the MPO. Um, so that's my report. So tomorrow's not the TAC meeting. Tomorrow Tomorrow's is the policy meeting. It's the policy meeting. Just related to that. If, but, so I should, so my knee jerk reaction is to be appalled that they're carving out money for recreational trails when we've got bridges that are falling down. It's a small it's a small dollar. I, I'm 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 still my that's still my knee jerk reaction that big or small. I no I'm purples. No, no, no. It's, I mean, so my feedback to you as my representative would be that if you can ever express that, if you, if you feel from talking to people that other people have that feeling as well, feel free to express that. Um, as far as like the rail trail and things like that, I think that if you need an easement, you know, I mean, there's no reason why we couldn't, as a town, find a way to do that. If that, I mean, I don't... It, my another knee jerk. My knees were jerking over here. My knee jerk reaction to that one is: Why would we even worry about the feds or any grants with regard to getting somebody near the trail to cough up, you know, a few square feet of land for a parking lot? Well, I, I was expecting to present this to the board of selectmen um, at the next meeting. Um, the uh, and, and get the get the thought process going on that, and, and it very well may be that it might not require any additional outside funding, I don't know. 
Um, but the commitment, as, as uh, Ernie Brown and I talked about, would be who's going to plow it in the winter so that people can use it for cross-country skiing, but not so much that you have snowmobile trailers there. I mean, so, I mean, it, there's, there's just, I'd like to begin the dialogue um, on that. That's is all. that a snowmobile route? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, it is? Mm -hmm. Does it cross uh, new land acquisitions? Interestingly, the, uh, the, the land that is going to be the town's land is, uh, you may or may not know that Pike Brook, and it's all swampy back in that area, but where the town property, at least the best I could judge when I, when I um, went through there during the uh, a quiet spell in the winter, it appears that there is an ability from the town land to access without having to get your feet wet. There's there's a um, there's a rise. There's a place where the the rail trail goes through a kind of a, a, a natural um, uh, bridge, not bridge if you will, but I mean, it's it's dry land from the rail trail uh, that would be south and west to the to the uh, town property and that eventually will be a great opportunity to access the trail um, but uh, you know if somebody's going to have to build a road who's going to build a road down there <laughs> at any rate i mean there's all sorts of opportunities but that was, was really that was, I was really thinking of in the cemetery and skiing it, down It doesn't have to be a paved road. It doesn't right. No, road. it doesn't. No, I mean somebody have to clear the. I I bushwhacked through there. Um, mm -hmm. There's no there's no simple access right now. But the important point is is that it doesn't require crossing the wetland. Good. And it's a, it's not it's it's a I don't know maybe two hundred feet hundred feet anyhow. Something to think about. The the yeah. rail is are those the same railroad tracks that cross Clark near the stream? Yes, that's the same. That's the rail trail. Doesn't Ernie own? Does Ernie own that land? He owns. Uh, he owns. He <laughs> wants it actually. So I mean, he's all he's fully on board with. He, he is. This, uh, he is, and, and you know, with? we'll we'll have that discussion. <laughs> um, you know, but I didn't know that when I started the thought process and right. tried trying to track the money, <clears> and then trying to find out who else has got the money. But that was like pulling teeth. Well, I think that it wouldn't be unreasonable to pursue having the town, you know, do you know, fund you know, fund the improvement of a parking area and plowing it. That wouldn't be an unreasonable thing as a recreational thing. I mean, we're already throwing money around for recreation. So. <laughs> Don't get started. <laughs> anyway, sorry. For five years, I complained and asked them to explain, Federal Highways, explain how is it that in one, in one sentence they will say that the gas tax, and they've been saying this for years, the gas tax is not enough to fund the infrastructure that uh, repairs and maintenance that we need. But in the, you go to the next sentence and they're creating grants and giving out money for rails to trails. It doesn't make any sense. They spent, um, they did a presentation when I was there. I don't know if it was Dover or Summersworth, but there was a, they, they got a grant to continue their rail to trail system in the tune of $500,000. Wow. And I'm like, well, how do you say you don't have enough money to maintain the system, but then you're giving money away for this? I said, why don't we use the 500000 to fix the bridge that's down, down there? But you're going to, and how does the federal government give grant money away when they don't have anything? Five years ago, it was 15.5 trillion, and now five years later, it's 19 trillion, and that's going to accelerate. So how are they going to pay for this? But they have enough money to give out to the states in block grants. It doesn't make any sense to me. And I never got, I never get a clear answer. I get that. <coughs> Well, we that strange look. You know right. what I'm saying. We can talk about it after. <laughs> yes. I did have one more quick comment. No problem. Will you? I'm done. Uh, there's a TV program called Tiny House Nation, 
where people build tiny houses and they, you know. <laughs> My wife loves that show. Right, and, and I'm wondering if we have an opportunity here to bring high quality, younger people who are professional that want to start out in a tiny house in Brookfield. If you look at our ordinance now, you can't do it. And I know it was created to prevent trailers and trailer parks and those type of people from coming in. But the zoning ordinance could be set up so you can have those tiny houses. Some of them are very nice. And, you know, no student that comes out of college can afford a three to four hundred thousand dollar house. They can't. But maybe they can have a tiny house. And I'm wondering if we should head, head, head it off because I don't know anywhere in the state that allows, or, or, or uh, not only allows, but actually has it stipulated in the ordinance, the parameters of a tiny house, because I don't think they should be still categorized as trailers. So you'll notice that most of those are on trailers, right? If you watch that show, they're, and I think that that's partly lifestyle so they can move it around, but also partly to get around a lot of zoning. But there's other states obviously allow it. So I wonder if there's already ordinances that handle that type of type of thing. Our ordinance would be uh, you just take out the 864 square foot minimum size and you could do, allow that. But I think I think your thought is maybe something slightly more comprehensive than that. Yeah. What, what, but, is a, what is a tiny house? What is a tiny house? It's a small house. They're be, they're generally between like 175 and 500 square feet, yeah. full a complete house. It, I mean, you you have to be really committed to, like living in a chair. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> I mean, it's you know, and uh, but yeah, they're like complete houses, but you know, just making extremely good use of space. And you just can't own junk. You just can't. You can't own anything because you have no place to put it. But I mean, you you still would have to. You know, you would have to do the setbacks. You'd have to have a septic. You'd have to have all that stuff already. But to restrict, you know, a new homeowner that may want to live like that just because we don't want you know trailers. It just I just thought it was a good opportunity to to bring you know quality people to town. Well, I think that the workforce housing thing that was forced down our throats a few years ago, um, you know, tries to address that, but it really, it, you know, it's really aimed at building neighborhoods of, you know, low cost housing versus letting somebody, you know, do it on their own. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the aspects of, one of the parts of the workforce housing argument that they're making is that you can't force people to have two acres of land because it's too expensive. And, you know, I mean, at the time it was 60,000 bucks to get a building lot here in town. I'm not sure what it is now. I mean, so, is it the same? So, you know, that right off the bat, you're, you know, you're, you're at, you know, 80,000 by the time you have a well and septic, right? The reason why I brought it up is because the new legislation states that uh, accessory dwelling units could count towards our um, workforce housing quota. So if we work the ordinance that, to allow tiny houses, they could be, you know, they could work into that quota. I'm trying to get to, because we don't even know if we even need it or exceeded or we don't even know that yet. I think we had to go and get some kind of study done in order to do that. I had a couple, well, it's probably several years, but th two or three years ago now, I talked to Matt at SRPC, mm -hmm. um, and he was going to look into it because they had just done their housing needs assessment, and he was going to try to figure out if we, using our current inventory, met our, our fair share. I would, it was just a thought, just to bring it up. Can you do a tiny house on a foundation? Sure you can. So it's not a trailer anymore? 
Yeah, yeah they, they do that. You, you can drop it on, on a little pad. Maybe something Just like that. Or, maybe something like that is doable. Make it a permanent structure. Was there legislation around this? It seems to me that I have read something in passing about tiny houses being somehow constrained on the state level, or that there were. Have you heard anything about that? Or maybe it was. I don't know. I, I, I might be confused. It might have been. I think it was. Oh, I'm sorry. It wasn't this legislature. There was one community that had challenged it, or somebody was challenging it, and maybe that's what you're. You mean someone tried to build it, or, or, or couldn't get a permit, and I can't remember why. Um, it was not the legislature. I'm sorry. I, yeah, I don't know. Any more comments? So, just my thought, my knee, another knee-jerk reaction is that if we can do things that make it easier for people to live the way they want to here in a safe and orderly manner, I think I'm all for it. Right? I think it's worth. Looking at see what we can do and what gotchas there are. So I got twenty thousand people. I remember that. <laughs> Just kidding. I was going to ask. Him, I was going to ask. Him, Good people. Got them all queued up. I mean, but you know, to to that, you know, one of the the things we a few years ago there was a proposed zoning amendment to allow accessory dwelling units not inside of the main residence be able to have it be in a detached building, and that was. Defeated, um, I think pretty soundly. I don't, know if, I don't remember what the vote was, but it was not close. I don't think um, there was a lot of fear about uh, everyone having renters come into town, and I don't know what their fear was that they were going to vote for street lights or have kids or I don't know what. But there was, you know, th there was pushback at the time. I'm not sure whether it was. Uh, the right decision, but because um, I think you talk about wanting to lower the cost of living in a place, and um, you know, a finished barn or something like that, you know, might be a you know a, a relatively inexpensive way to go because you're starting with a building that's already there, and already paid for, right? You know, you're just gonna do some finish work and add some heat or something. So. Yes. Sorry to continue this, I'll be very brief, uh, but in that vein, it struck me um, uh, as I was getting ready for the meeting and flipping through some things that I had provided some information to everybody, I think I think I did via email, for a session that I had gone to uh, at SRPC that was another presentation, and it was a, one of this, the main focus of this was the uh, ADUs and the new, the not, it wasn't state legislation, but it was the federal, um, federal Supreme Court? Yes, it was the federal Supreme Court had made a ruling that was causing a lot of communities to need to re-examine the um, accessory dwelling unit zoning that they have. I didn't, I think it was during the holidays and I didn't pay an awful lot of attention to it, frankly, even though I sent it up to you, sorry. Uh, and I have to go back and dust that off. But I, I think that that might be something. I'll, I'll look at it again and maybe I can report back at the next meeting um, whether we need to pursue this. You know, possibly looking at changes to be brought to the voters next year. Send that out again if you find it. The, 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 uh, there was a federal ruling, a uh, federal court ruling that was it fair? No, wait a minute. I'm getting confused between the signage, it was sign issues, and accessory dwelling units. And now I, I'm, I'm getting that mixed up. It was the sign issue that was um, a federal ruling. The accessory dwelling unit, I think, was a New Hampshire issue. But let me go back and, and dust this back off and, and perhaps bring it at the next meeting rather than waste any more time. The New, Hampshire, perfect memory. the New Hampshire House passed the accessory dwelling unit okay, so it was legislation. Okay. I don't know if it's through the Senate and signed, but yeah, it did get what voted. What does that bill do? <coughs> it allows you to do it. It allows the zone.
going to to allow people to have accessory, accessory dwelling units. It, it expands. But our, our it zoning already has that. It, but it expands it's it. it, it there, I'll, I'll provide that information. The, the wording on this is very loose, as you can have yeah. all sorts of things now toward it. But there were some towns that tried to say you can't. So the state came down and said, no, you can't. So, ta so towns have to allow, so this new legislation would force our zoning to allow something that it may not currently allow. All right, time okay. out. We're not going for extra yeah. time. Okay. Meeting adjourned. <laughs> Keep talking. Just got here. Keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> Don't leave. I'm sorry. Keep talking. <laughs> oh, here's your cap. I like the beer. Oh, thank you. Thank Very you. Nice. I was just coming over to Happy get Happy St. Patty's Day.